But we can also use technologies to help us be mentally healthy. Um, one example of that is uh, we can play video games. So games usually get a lot of negative media attention, people saying that they're bad for you. Um, but actually, our research shows that they can be good for you and they really help you to recover from the stresses and strains of work. So people who play video games are, are better recovered from work stress than people who don't. Welcome to Digital Mindfulness. I'm your host, Lawrence Sampofo. Today we're here with Dr. Anna Cox, and she's the Deputy Director of the UCL Interaction Centre in London. As a Professor of Human and Computer Interaction, Anna has focused her research on the application of cognitive science to human-computer interaction and also technology's potential to impact work and life balance. You should listen to this show if you want to understand how to achieve work-life balance in a connected world and also how digital systems and humans can be brought together meaningfully. But first of all, welcome to Digital Mindfulness. For over three years now, we've brought you the best teachers and thought leaders to teach you how to be your best self in a digitally distracted world. If you're new to our show, then the best place to find out much more about us is to visit digitalmindfulness.net forward slash start, which has a collection of some required listening podcasts, which contain everything from being more focused to habit building to cyberbullying and much more. Okay, enjoy the show with Dr. Anna Cox. Hi Anna, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on Digital Mindfulness today and I'm really looking forward to our discussion, so welcome to the show. Thanks very much, it's great to be here. So I'm wondering, just for people that don't know very much about you, if you can share a little bit about your background. How did you get into this whole field of not just human and computer interaction, but particularly how it relates to behaviour change and the way that people work? Okay, so... um I did an undergraduate degree in cognitive science, um, which is kind of mainly, I guess, a bit of cognitive psychology and a bit of artificial intelligence. Um, and then uh, it was through that that I got introduced to human computer interaction or HCI, as we tend to refer to it. Um, I did a master's and a PhD in that area. And, uh, and then I guess it's just kind of over time like if you work in this area there's no shortage of things to look at because computers are really everywhere now um, and whereas some of my colleagues their research is concerned with designing the computer interfaces of the future um, most of my focus is on understanding how we use computer interfaces now and what impact they have on our lives so you know we all carry around very small computers in our pockets. We just call them smartphones. And, and lots of us now have them on our wrists as well with smartwatches and so on. And so really that's looking at, um, you know, behavior change and looking at how people might use technology at work. It's just everywhere. So uh, I think it just caught my, it caught my interest and I've just been doing it for a while. So, um, so I know that um, at the UCL Interaction Centre, you've been involved in some amazing large scale projects on the very topic that we've just been speaking about. And I know that this is um, kind of like a very big question, but with regards to the digital communications part of your work, particularly the bits on multitasking and interruptions, what would you say are some of the key problems and solutions to the research that you've been conducting? So, um, yeah, we've, there are a few of us who've been looking at uh, multitasking and interruptions for a while because, you know, it's one of those things that digital technologies kind of bring to us. Um, you know, you're engaged in trying to get on with some work and then there's some beep from your smartphone or you get an email alert pops up. Um, so I think as soon as we kind of started having email probably is the, the kind of first mainstream digital technology. People started noticing how it interrupted their day-to-day -day work. Um, so we've been looking at it at, 
at what we kind of refer to as the micro level, so looking at very low level impacts of these sorts of interruptions. So if you get interrupted by something, what does that do to your efficiency, to your work efficiency, to how quickly you're able to complete a task um, and how quickly you can, after you've been interrupted, how quickly can you get back to your primary task and can you do that accurately? And uh, you know, we've shown how um, various different factors about that interruption. So when exactly it happens, um, how long it lasts for, and the content of it, how those sorts of things can make the impact of that interruption better or worse, basically. So certain sorts of interruptions can can lead to you being almost quite, you know, um, almost extra confused about what was it I was actually doing just before this? So, um, so it makes it hard for you to get back to what you were doing at the beginning. And so then also, you know, like when you see those sorts of problems, you think, okay, well, how, how can we design computer systems to make it easy for people to resume their tasks? I mean, it's relatively easy to, uh, for a system to detect that you've stopped working on something. You can track, um, you know, has someone stopped typing or is that window that they were doing that task in no longer in focus on their computer? And so you can see when they come back to it. Um, and so when someone flips back to their um, primary window, um, you can you can t time particular interventions um, to help them remember where they were. So you could provide a cue, for example. So, you know, a very simple uh, version where if you imagine somebody is editing a document and they come back to this page full of text and they're like, well, where was I? Um, you make sure that the bit they were just working on is highlighted in some way to bring their attention straight back to where they left off from. Um, but I guess also there you can then, when we look at these interruptions, we don't just see this at this like low level um, where we're looking at these kind of millisecond or second differences we also see people switching between you know bigger tasks in fact bigger parts of their life so the more communication um, digital communication uh, channels we have the more we seem to be switching between work and non-work aspects of our life at all times of the day so we've also been looking at that that kind of thing and how um how some of the technology we, technologies we have lead to people feeling like they're blurring the boundaries between those parts of their life. I'm just, I mean, that that everything you just said there is really, really fascinating. And, and we've done a lot of work here at Digital Mindfulness with this, but this just continues to fascinate me, this whole idea that not only are we switching between tasks, but we're switching between different selves right different identities the I mean you just kind of mentioned there the personal and professional um yeah. sides of us and and we're doing this actually in the workplace as well yeah and, and the, because workplaces are changing aren't they I mean we don't all work in very traditional office setups even if what we're doing looks like that kind of traditional office type work people are increasingly working at home, working on the commute, working in cafes, working in other kinds of spaces. Um, and that, and often they're working at different times of the, the day or even different times of the week, you know. So people don't necessarily work a strict Monday to Friday, nine to five. They might have to do stuff at the weekend, but that might be because they're having Tuesday off to go somewhere, you know. So so we see this increasing flexibility in how people are working and that that means that they they tend to i guess be a bit more open to flipping between these different parts of their life more quickly uh, and at different times mm -hmm. i was just going to ask i mean you've talked about you just literally said then about people being more open to switching but I'm wondering if you can share like just some of the principal impacts of 
this self switching, if you like, or this um, this fluidity, I guess you know that yeah. digital forces. So, so I think I think it brings um, some really huge advantages. Um, it enables people to work around caring responsibilities, for example. So you know, I guess historically there's been a huge waste of talent when um, women have been very highly educated. Uh, they've taken time off to have their families and then they've tried to get back into work and found that much more difficult than they expected. Um, but the fact now that work can be so much more flexible in terms of time and space means that they're able to fit it in around picking their children up from school um, and certainly as we have many people now having responsibility for taking care of their parents as their parents age um, we see these kinds of responsibilities becoming more and more prevalent within society so I think one of the massive advantages of the impact of digital technologies is that people can now take part in the workforce where they used to be excluded from it um, but it does it does bring some tricky aspects because you might want to say, okay, I'm going to work while my kids are at school, and then just before you have to leave to go and pick them up, at the end of the day, some important thing happens. And, uh, you know, because you've got mobile technology, you think, okay, I can deal with this while I'm stood in the playground waiting for them to come up. Um, but that's not really the kind of situation that's conducive to <laughs> dealing with a problem or a crisis. So you can see how it kind of brings some challenges because the, these boundaries between work and non-work are getting blurred in a way that people want. But then it, it's kind of taken us some time to adjust and to work out exactly how best to deal with them. Would you say then, <clears throat> excuse me, would you say then, Anna, that then there's another technical solution that will, um, I don't know, that will solve this problem? For example, do you think AI will then, sorry, artificial intelligence will then come in to fill that gap of knowing the right time to send you the right piece of information? Or or I, I don't know, do, or do you think actually this is more something to do with us as professionals ourselves that we have to learn how to build better boundaries i i think it's both actually i think i think we we already have um we have systems that are either sort of in the des they're currently being designed and developed or um you know that already exist that can help us here to either stay focused on something by blocking out all sorts of other things. So there are lots of things now that will block out your uh, your ability to go off and check Facebook, for example, to help you stay focused on the task at hand. Um, but there are also people building systems that are trying to sort of use those things I was talking about earlier about automatically detecting when you might be on a break from something and saying, oh, now might be a good point to show you that Facebook update or deliver your email to you because I can see that you're not currently engaged in, in a writing task. Um, and similarly, we can imagine it's relatively easy to set up uh, things so that you only get, you only have certain things delivered to you when you're in a certain physical location. So, you might say, yeah, never deliver important news to me when I'm in the playground. Um, so I think there is definitely room for that, those sorts of tools to help us. But I think the other thing that we really need to do is to ensure that we have um, a really good understanding of what we want. And that isn't the same for everybody. Um, there's existing research that shows that people have different styles and preferences in terms of how how permeable those boundaries between work and life are 
So some people like really rigid, firm boundaries. They, they don't want the other part of their life interrupting. Other people are really happy to be, to be flipping between them very regularly. So I think we could do with some help in working out what it is we really want and what works for us. Um, and, and that might be through tools that can help us reflect on how, how are we behaving now? What, what does our life really look like now? And um, by gathering data about how we use our technologies, for example, um, and correlating that with how exhausted we feel or how happy we feel. Um, and so once we get an understanding of how we want to live our lives and what really works for us, then we can start really taking control of our devices and setting them up in such a way as to work effectively for us. So it sounds a lot here that you're speaking about um, things like emotion recognition tools that can understand yeah. how we're feeling. Yeah, I think we, you know, there's there's probably, um, in the future, there's probably opportunities to use that kind of thing. But I think even now having something that just asks you, how do you feel right now? Um, you know, asking people to rate how tired they are, how happy they are, how stressed are they, those sorts of things. They can provide you with useful insights if you're looking at those sorts of measures um, across time and together with information about how many interruptions did I have today or how often did I flip between work and non-work activities. So I'm wondering, Anna, whether you think all interruptions are disruptive or whether you think actually they can be beneficial at all? There are definitely times when um, the information that might get sent to you is really timely and important. And this is one of the things that makes interruption management systems very, very difficult to build. So um, you just take the situation of I'm working towards a deadline and, uh, and I'm feeling very stressed because, you know, maybe I should have started work on this earlier than I did. And the deadline gets extended. Well, I want to know that straight away. So if all my email has been blocked, um, I might not get that critical bit of information. Similarly, you can, you can see how there are certain people who we tend to think, information from them we want to get that straight away uh you know some people might feel that if there's an email from their boss they definitely want to know that's in their inbox um or if there's an email from their mum they might definitely want to know that's in their inbox so uh, it it does get very difficult when we're trying to build systems to automatically detect what's important to us Hmm. I'm interested to know as well with with regards to things like um you know um um government policy that of course government policy regulates a lot how people interact with technologies um but even things like this you're talking about interruption management systems right so even um government or pol or company policy stating when people can and can't um interacts with their with their work emails etc or information at work what do you think of those do you think that they're that they're productive um i think they i think it's good that they're being considered um and because it provides the kind of stepping stone to people having conversations about what works for them and how they want to work but i think we it's probably not the best idea to think that one blanket policy is going to work for everybody. Um, there is certainly, um, you know, some people who very much like to have the traditional nine to five, five days a week working style. But for others, that really doesn't work for them. And as soon as an organization or a government says, well, here is a rule um, we're immediately excluding a whole bunch of people. So, you know, I wouldn't want to argue for traditional working styles, just like I don't want to argue that flexibility works for everybody, because 
clearly it doesn't. But that's why we need help in understanding what really is going to work for us as individuals and uh, and then having some guidance to how we can make those things a reality. And, and it's not that what works for me this year will necessarily work for me next year because, of course, life changes things around us and we have different responsibilities that, uh, you know, that come and take places in our lives. And so people need to be able to adapt the way that they're working over time too. So Anna, we spoke a little bit about um, emotion recognition technologies and how software can just understand our, us emotionally um, increasingly. But I'm wondering the extent to which you think this is actually going to be able to happen. Like whether you think machines really will fully understand where people are um, emotionally from a cognitive load perspective so that then we can begin to improve our experiences in the real world supported by the digital? I can certainly um, imagine that as these these connect... So these devices are connected to each other, but also connected to um, a, a basically a big data source about us. And, uh, and that gives opportunities for the system to know a lot about us. Um, you know, hence how many, you know, very successful e-commerce websites are able to tell you other things you might want to buy because it knows a lot about what you have already bought and also what other people like you have already bought. So we already see examples of uh, of this kind of big data being used to deliver useful things to us. Um, and certainly we might expect more and more of that um, as systems being tailored to what works best for us. But I think we don't, we don't want all of that to necessarily always happen automatically. Um, and we want to ensure that the user has control over some of these things. I mean, if you take my e-commerce shopping example, you always see things where you think, I would never want to buy that. I mean, the system does get it wrong. And, uh, and, we, and we have to be mindful of that because, of course, if we start allowing computer systems to have total control over these sorts of things – they will sometimes get it wrong and we need to make sure the user can adjust the setting so that they have control over what's being delivered and when and why. But men, <clears throat> excuse me, many evangelists would say that privacy doesn't exist anymore at all. But from what you're saying to me, and, and of course you're, you're an expert in this and how people interact with technology, <clears throat> you're saying that privacy still is very important. I think I think users feel that privacy is very important. Uh, I think you'd be hard pushed to find a user that doesn't think privacy is important. We all want to feel that we have some control over our data. Um, I think you know we probably do have to agree with people to some extent who say there's a lot of your data you don't have control over because we give it away very easily. Um, and and we're often encouraged to do that under the guise of and this system will help you to do something um, you know all the people who now haven't uh, I try not to use a brand name um, all those people who've got one of um, you know a device in the house that you can speak to and ask it to put the radio on or tell you what's on your calendar um, or, you know, what's the weather forecast for today. Um, though there are many people who are concerned not just about which systems you are letting that device have access to. So it knows, it can see in your calendar, can see everything that you're paying to do, um, but also that it's monitoring everything that's said in your house. Um so, you know, there are a lot of people who are very concerned about what happens to that data and making sure that, um, you know, I guess it's only used for good purposes. You know, you've been working for many years 
to understand the human element in technology. And I wonder, in your opinion, what does it mean to be human in a hyper-connected age? Well, I think it never before have we had such a situation where we're able to connect to others and to information as quickly and easily as we can now. And it really is changing the world in terms of shrinking physical space. So um, I think that for many people, the physical distance is becoming less and less important. We can know what's happening in other places as it happens. Um, You know, we're inundated at the moment with what's happening in the news and people are are reporting their reaction to um, news alerts on their phones thinking, oh, what's happened next, you know. Um, But also we can see how this is connecting people in, in, in really important ways. So one example of this is that just last week, my niece graduated from university and her university streamed the graduation ceremony. And this meant that her grandparents and her aunts and uncles on the other side of the world were able to watch in real time and effectively be there. And, you know, we we saw her walk across the stage and then she got back to her seat, by which point she has messages telling her, how proud everyone is of her and you know I think that it's not just the fact that these people were the other side of the planet and still able to join in but there but it makes us all feel connected to each other in a way that just wouldn't be possible without this stuff so I think um I think the one of you know the one of the greatest things about digital technology is just how it can really help you to maintain and develop strong connections and strong relationships with people who you care about. Great, great. So you've done a lot of work on the Internet of Things and work-life balance. And I'm wondering how can connected devices bring about greater work-life balance and I'm wondering if you think that this is the future for um, for everyone basically in the workplace. Um, so I think that there are a number of things that uh, technology can enable us to do when thinking about work-life balance. Um, one is that it can help us collect data about how we live. Um, often it's really hard to actually accurately remember what you did, where you went, how you felt at any particular point. Um, so I think we can use we can use these devices to help us get a new perspective on our lives, which we can then reflect on and examine, think about whether that's really what we want to be doing. Um, we can use our devices to help us um, change aspects of our life. So that might be through using various behavior change technologies. Um, But equally, it might be just in how we decide to set up our our devices and to use the different systems that we have. Um, So, for example, uh, if you feel like you tend to check your work email at times when you are with your friends and you really wish you didn't do that, Um, There are strategies you can adopt which are relatively simple that can really help you to change your behavior. Those strategies might include putting all your work stuff on a separate phone and not taking that work phone out with you. But they can also be um, even smaller than that. So just having separate accounts for work and home email or separate, separate apps for work and home email. We've seen examples of people using these strategies to really kind of separate these different parts of their life. Um, But I think also we can really think about how we can harness the power of computer systems to help us live a healthy life and, um, and one that really makes us happy. And there are lots of examples of technologies now that help us be physically healthier. So we can use them to track 
how many steps we take and set goals for what we're going to do tomorrow. Um, but we can also use technologies to help us be mentally healthy. Um, one example of that is uh, we can play video games. So games usually get a lot of negative media attention, people saying that they're bad for you. Um, but actually, our research shows that they can be good for you and they really help you to recover from the stresses and strains of work. So people who play video games are, are better recovered from work stress than people who don't. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're going to have to go into more detail about that because I'm, <laughs> sure, I'm sure there are loads of people that would be fascinated by this. I mean, how... I can tell you a bit about how that how that kind of works. So, yeah. um, so when we play, play games, we are absorbed by the activity. So it really takes over your attention. You feel completely immersed in it. Um, it also provides you with the opportunity to feel like you're facing a challenge and you're winning at that. You're mastering it. Um, and there are also games that provide you to um, with opportunities for social interaction. So you might be playing with um, with co-located friends, so other people sat in your living room, or you might be playing with someone who's digitally remote from you, who you may know in the real world, or you may not. And research has shown us that those three things, so having your attention completely grabbed by something, um, overcoming challenges and feeling that you're gaining mastery and uh, having social interaction are all are three important things for helping us to recover from work stress I think but I think this is fascinating though because we've spoken on the one hand about the um, the impacts of distractions and mm -hmm. particularly like the negative impacts of, of distractions we've spoken that, about that a lot on the show but also you're saying how video games and they're very very good at this at grabbing all of our attention and that actually by grabbing our attention it helps us helps direct our focus and helps us to process what we've been through during the day so yeah. it's really interesting um everything you're saying about how technologies almost can help bring balance i mean we've been talking about work-life balance but how technology can bring you know balance to us not only from a professional perspective but also from a mental health perspective yeah yeah I, I think that's the thing isn't it that we really don't want to lump all technology in together and say that is good or that is bad um and we don't and we need to, there's no single technology where we can categorically say that is good or that is bad for us. You know, a little bit of everything does you good is what they say. And and you don't want to do too much playing games. You don't want to do too much work either. Um, but having some balance between those things is is the best thing to do. And we really can make use of technology to help us um, do all of those things well so a bit of candy crush doesn't do anyone exactly. any harm <laughs> um so my penultimate question um anna is um what one core recommendation would you give to people that complain that they're digitally distracted to overcome the effects of work-life imbalance and multitasking well, clearly I'm tempted to say go and play Candy Crush. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think really it is about uh, you need to, it's good to step back and really think hard about what do you want? What is really going to work for you? Um, if there's no real need for you to be checking your work communications outside of your work hours, how can you set up your smartphone so that you're not tempted? Um, and that, and there are ways to do that in terms of, you know, completely deleting that off your phone if you never really need to use it on there, or perhaps just hiding it away um, within a folder so that you, you don't see it and you're far less tempted to go and look at it. So I think understanding ourselves 
working out what our preferences are and then really taking control of our technology to set up uh, the technology in such a way that it helps us live our life in line with our values. Um, Anna, unfortunately, we've come to the end. Um, but where can people find out more about you and your work? Uh, well, I'm on Twitter at Dr. Anna L. Cox, all one word. And you can find my web page by Googling Anna Cox UCL. Well, Anna, thank you again for sharing your time and your wisdom with us today. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's been a lot of fun.